Let's begin with prayer. Let's pray. Amazing grace has given us life and hope and peace. Everything that is permanent, lasting, and good is by your grace. And every truly good work comes about only by your grace. And so, Father, we acknowledge that and we ask for fresh measures of grace for this hour. We pray through him who saved us by his own blood. Amen. Amen. Well, it is very much an honor and a privilege to be invited. Uh, What was it that you said I would say? Um, (laughs) Whatever he said I would say, I say that. Um, I say that sincerely. Uh, I'm sure you have surveyed the qualifications and attainments of the various instructors. And if you have, you will be impressed that my qualifications are essentially two. I'm older than all the other guys, and the people in Mebane have an amazing degree of patience. And they have put up with me for a very long time. And I'm very thankful for both of those deals, living longer than I should have, maybe, and uh, particularly the patience of God's people. But I'm not at all confident that that qualifies me to be doing what I'm doing here. Uh, In fact, I'm fairly confident that it doesn't. But I'm here in the hope that God will do what he sometimes does, and he takes the weak and the foolish And for the praise of his own glory, he does something through them. And I'm speaking sincerely when I say I pray, and I hope for your sake that he will do that again. It's perhaps inevitable that um, there will be some redundancy in a format like this. It's probably even likely that there will be some uh, contradiction. We're involved in a subject that can be handled exegetically, but it's a subject that also involves a good deal of practical counsel. And in the realm of practical counsel, there may be uh, some contradictions. And so I want to say up front, If anything that I say contradicts the counsel of my brethren, you forget what I say and you listen to them. I have assigned the following very simple titles to my first two lectures, The Pastor with God and The Pastor with Himself. I don't think that those who preach ought to apologize for their material. I wish it were better, but I'm not going to apologize because I think it's true. Um, But I do apologize for having to spend so much time during these days in the material. Uh, In my pastoral experience, there's usually a matter of hours between completing the material and preaching the material. Uh, This material was prepared a few weeks ago. I've never handled it before. And... I spent all my time since I got here trying to figure out what I meant (laughs) by uh, some of those things. And and that's not funny. If you're the the lecturer, that's not funny. Um, But to my sorrow, I'd rather be here listening. I really would. I'd profit. But I anticipate that I'm going to have to go back and try to resurrect the material for the other lectures. Well, first of all, the pastor with God, and under this heading, I want to divide the material into two subpoints: the cause of the ministry and the success of the ministry. First of all, the cause of the ministry. Now, in speaking about the cause of the ministry, I do not have in view 
that eternal scheme of God, which determined that verbal proclamation would occupy such a strategic role in bringing his grace to perishing humanity. Verbal proclamation, verbal proclamation made through reclaimed sinners. People who were on the tri-sheep, and he reclaimed them. And he has appointed that through the vocal apparati and the mental effort of reclaimed sinners that he will bring his saving truth to the world. Why? Now, to be certain, that's a fascinating subject. And it deserves a serious degree of thought. Why verbal proclamation and not visual displays? I mean, we are being told today that it is more effective if we will use the visual and not just the verbal. Well, God could have used some really remarkable visual displays. I mean, he did create the world. And, and he, could, he could cause a storm to come every time the church gathers together with bright lightning and a booming voice out of heaven. I mean, he did it at Sinai. He could do that. And we're told he, he would have seen more people converted if he had done that. No. But why did he choose verbal proclamation by ordinary, less than ordinary sometimes, men? Well, that's not what I'm thinking about, but it is something worthy of thinking about. Rather, when I speak of the cause of the ministry, I'm thinking about the cause that is responsible for the service that is assigned to individual men throughout the history of the church. If any of us, maybe all of us, are engaged in viable, legitimate ministry, how and why has that come about? Well, consider Paul's answer to the question given in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12. And Paul wrote, And I thank... Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Now, first of all, it's noteworthy that Paul was thankful to be in the ministry. By this time, he had experienced enormous suffering physically and emotionally. He testified to carrying around the stress, the burden of being responsible for the well-being of the churches, not just one, many churches. The implications of the ministry were heavy to Paul. But as he thought about the ministry, he rejoiced. He was glad. He was thankful. There are seasons in which ministers may be tempted not to be thankful for the ministry they have received. Maybe a temptation to view it as a burden, as a weight, as something almost unbearable. Well, I've been there. But we must pray against that. We must war against a complaining ungrateful spirit. Remember this. A minister's enthusiasm is a major component to the success of his labor. After all, who's going to take seriously a man who takes no delight in the message he is proclaiming or in the privilege of proclaiming it? As heavy as a burden, as awesome, sometimes as unthinkable as the implications of the ministry are, we must go to Christ and plead for the grace to rejoice in the privilege and to rejoice in the content, most of all, of what we're saying. 
Our bouts with unthankfulness are things that we must win before we get into the pulpit or into the study. Now, no small part of Paul's thankfulness was his awareness that his position as a gospel minister required something of a miracle. Something of a miracle. He was formerly a blasphemer regarding Christ. He was, he had been a persecutor of Christ's church. He says that he was an arrogant and violent man. And now he is astonished. And I rather suspect that Paul never got over the amazement every day. I'm a Christian. (laughs) I'm a Christian. I was determined there wouldn't be any Christianity. And now I am one. What mercy I've received. But not only that. Not only have I been turned from the folly of my presuppositions, but I'm actually in the forefront of taking the message of Christianity to the world. It was an incredible thing to Paul. Note the actual words by which Paul describes this miracle. The English Standard Version translates part of 1 Timothy 1.12 in this way. He judged me faithful appointing me to his service. Now think about that. He judged me faithful. That denotes an appointment. It denotes a spiritual and positional exercise on the part of Christ. Christ looked at him and judged him faithful. What was the criteria? In what way had Paul displayed faithfulness? prior to his call into the ministry. The only faithfulness, the only faithfulness that Paul had displayed was his faithfulness in hating Christ. His faithfulness in chasing down Christians and trying to extort from them a denial of their professed faith. He had been a faithful persecutor. But that's hardly criteria for the gospel ministry. Christ judged him faithful. It it was sheer mercy. Christ judging Paul faithful. That was a decision on Christ's part. He decided that this is how he would view Paul and this is how he would work in Paul's life. He would see him as a faithful man and he would make him to become a faithful man. That was all Christ. It was Christ that broke in on him in the midst of his hysterical hatred for Christ and the gospel. It was Christ's decision to break in on him. It was Christ's determination to see him as a faithful man and then to make him to become a faithful man. Now, was Paul doing anything in this process? Well, yes, of course. Lord, who are you? Oh. Oh. And he had to think through everything that he had believed about this Jesus. And he had to reflect over the things he had said about him. And he had to come to new conclusions. And his testimony in Philippians 3.8 reflects the fruit of that Thinking and praying, Paul said, yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Paul was proud of his attainments as a Jew. He had worked hard to get where he was. All of that now had to be subordinated, even trashed. It had to be reckoned by him as worthless, useless. He was glad for the accurate knowledge of the Old Testament he had. But the titles and the favor, the position he had assumed, all that had to be set aside in behalf 
of Christ. But you see, before all of this, Christ had reckoned Paul to be faithful, which in turn committed Christ to being powerfully active in Paul's life. He wasn't a faithful man when Christ judged him to be faithful. That was a commitment on Christ's part to become active in Paul's life. In 1 Timothy 1.12, Paul describes the activity of Christ in two ways. First, Christ set or placed Paul in the ministry. And the word ministry here is used in that more formal or official sense. Not just service, but the ministry. Christ set him in the ministry. And for Paul, that meant something more than it means for us. He made him an apostle as one born out of due season. He made him to become the wise master builder of the church. Imagine Paul's conversation with the other apostles. Hey, guys, <clears throat> I haven't been around as, you, as long as you have, but I'm now your chief. These guys who argued among themselves, who will be the greatest? <laughs> and here's a guy who'd been trying to kill them. And he's introduced to them, and I don't know how to break this to you. <laughs> Amazing. It's not the way we would have done it. Christ set him in the ministry. It also meant, according to 1 Timothy 1.12, that Christ strengthened him supernaturally. And as Paul writes this testimonial, looking back now over years of experience, he says very simply, I thank Jesus Christ our Lord who has enabled me. I don't know any other way to put it. He's enabled me. Christ had so wonderfully, powerfully, faithfully enabled Paul that he had come to actually be content in every situation. He was content when he was standing before kings. He was content when he was being given favor by wealthy landowners. He was content when he was in prison cut off from his friends. And that was all because of the one who strengthened him, Christ. Now I very much realize that this is very well known, very basic information. But somehow I think it's easy to forget this in the weekly discharge of pastoral responsibilities. And whenever we do forget this, and we don't operate on this principle, we are apt to fall into serious errors of judgment, if not errors of doctrine. If there's anything that you remember from all the words that I hope to speak to you, it would be this. The gospel ministry is supernatural, or it's nothing. The Christian ministry is supernatural, or else it is nothing. We are representing the God who inhabits eternity, the one God who exists eternally in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that nobody can explain. We are representing a God who's all glorious, who spoke the worlds into existence. We're pleading with people to entrust their lives up until the very point of death, to a Savior who is the Son of God, who really did come in this world, and he really did live here, but he doesn't anymore, and they can't see him. And we're trying to persuade them to leave everything behind and to follow a Savior they can't see. And why do we think we can, we can possibly persuade them to do that? We're trusting in a Holy Spirit that we can't see. And if it's not supernatural, it's nothing. 
We don't have anything to say. We don't have any reason to expect anybody will believe us. We're on a fool's errand, unless it is supernatural. Now, what was true of Paul in an exceptional and spectacular way is true of every genuine gospel minister, though brought about in more ordinary and predictable ways. Namely, Christ counts us faithful. If we're his men, he has counted us faithful and set us in the ministry. Go to 2 Timothy, if you're following in the scriptures. And Paul talks a bit about Timothy's ministry. 2 Timothy 1, 6 and 7. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. He's reminding Timothy that he had entered the ministry in the more ordinary way, through the laying on of hands. And that's how we enter the ministry. We enter the ministry through an established ecclesiastical process, which hopefully is a biblically informed ecclesiastical process. If that process possesses biblical integrity, if the steps that are followed by the church are informed by the Bible and carried out conscientiously in much prayer with sound judgment, Christ himself stands over it, behind it, causing it to happen and bringing it to fruition. So that if through that duly appointed, biblically informed process, hands are laid on us and we are sent out to preach the gospel, we have warrant to believe that Christ has judged us faithful and set us in the ministry. But sometimes, sometimes the ecclesiastical process is manipulated and compromised in order to hasten a man's entrance into the ministry. Sometimes that comes about through very noble motives. We believe he's a good man. We believe that the church needs such men. We don't think we ought to take all the time that we ordinarily would to get to know him, examine him, examine his marriage and his relationship with his children and to know what kind of testimony he has without. It seems so cumbersome. I think we ought to just cut to the chase. Everybody likes him. He has a gift for gab, uh, preaching. <laughs> let's, let's, let's lay hands on him. Due process isn't followed. That's a very dangerous thing to do. Only Christ can create a true servant of the gospel. And I can tell you, I can assure you, nobody really wants to be in that work. No one really wants that responsibility unless he has objective reason to believe that Christ has chosen him and judged him faithful and thrust him out. How are you going to be faithful if Christ hasn't called you to the work, if Christ doesn't empower you, how are you going to be faithful? It is required of a steward that he be faithful. How are you going to be faithful if Christ doesn't have his imprimatur on what you're doing? Faithfulness to the basic responsibilities of discipleship is promised to everyone who abides in Christ. Every ordinary Christian who abides in Christ will be kept and will be rendered faithful by the grace of the Holy Spirit. But faithfulness, faithfulness in pastoral ministry, 
That's another matter entirely. That's not, that's not promised to anyone except those who are called to it. It's late on a Saturday afternoon. You're still trying to bring your Sunday morning sermon to completion. You're being distracted more so than usual by intruding thoughts. And it's not the ACC basketball game you're missing that is causing the intruding thoughts. You're having difficulty because you know that tomorrow evening, Sunday evening, after evening worship, you're going to have to lead the body of Christ in a business meeting. A business meeting which will require that you announce to the congregation that a prominent member of the church has been discovered in an extramarital affair, a homosexual affair. You're trying to prepare something in the Gospel of John, but you keep thinking, how am I going to do that? How am I going to lead the church through the devastating shock so that none of the weak sheep are left bewildered and subject to the enemy's attacks? And how are you going to guide the church into disciplinary action that is well calculated to recover the sinner while at the same time protecting the church and vindicating the name of Jesus Christ? And then, how are you going to minister to that devastated wife and those three teenage children? How are you going to do that? Well, brethren, you really don't want to be in that kind of situation unless you know that Christ himself placed you there. I'm not here because I manipulated the evidence or somebody manipulated the evidence for me. I'm here because Christ set me here. And because he set me here, I know he's committed to making me faithful. I don't know how he's going to do that. But he's not going to leave me. Without that assurance, you don't want to be in the ministry. You see, there is something heady about standing up in front and having a bunch of people look at you, listen to you. That can be heady. It's incredibly dangerous. Their souls, in some measure, are hanging on the way you execute your ministry. And then you've got all these other issues that fall under the umbrella of pastoral labor. Now, having Christ actually place you in the ministry through the ordained, biblically appointed means doesn't preclude the necessity of what you're doing here. The necessity of careful, wise preparation, an education calculated to furnish you with an accurate understanding of the Bible and an accurate awareness of God's works in history. In the scenario I just painted, being called of Christ into the ministry will not automatically equip you to do all the things that will have to be done in that kind of disciplinary situation. You will need instruction. You will need training. However, all the training and all the proper order in the world will not preserve the church. It will not fortify the weak souls of God's people. It will not impart hope to the violated wife and the utterly confused children. It won't convert the sinner. See, you need to know how you go about leading a church in an orderly way in dealing with those kind of unthinkable situations which do become real in our world. You have to know how to do that orderly, discreetly, carefully, gently, firmly. You have to be instructed 
But if you do it according to the book, who's going to make it work? Go on at the end of the day and you say, well, I think I did a good job. I did it according to the rules of church order. And people are at home saying, I wonder if any of this is real. I trusted that man with my soul. He was my Sunday school. What makes it work? Nothing short of the graciously irresistible activity of the living Christ will suffice. And ordinarily, ordinarily, Christ performs this supernatural, gracious, irresistible activity only through the pastors of his own choosing and making. Now, be sure, I, I'm using an extreme case. But there are probably men here who have faced things very similar to that. It happens in the real world. But given that the example was extreme, the realities are the same in the more ordinary and routine work of the pastor. There's simply no part of the work that can be executed successfully by sheer training or level of gift or earnestness. Training is necessary. Gift is a prerequisite. Earnestness, well, that goes without remark. A man's going to be earnest. He's going to give his heart to what he does. None of that equals success in the ministry. There has to be the supernatural activity of Christ. In 2 Corinthians 4, 7, a very familiar text, Paul said, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, so that the excellence of the power may be of God, not of us. There is power in a true ministry. There is power. There's efficacy. There's something that happens in a true ministry that cannot be explained. But it's not the vessel. It's not his giftedness. It's not his preparation, though all that's necessary. The power comes from God. And in order to have that power, we have to be set in the ministry by Christ himself. Pastors are vehicles appointed by God through which the living Christ delivers grace to those he has chosen for whom he died and builds his church. Vehicles through which real miracles occur. I say again, the Christian ministry is supernatural or it's nothing. Flesh and blood can't do it. So the cause of the ministry. What's the cause of the ministry? It's Christ. It's Christ himself. Each and every genuine ministry is the work of the living Christ. Perhaps there's no clear witness to this than the awesome reality represented in Romans 10. In Romans 10, 13 and following. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? That's what I've been describing. The miracle happens as people hear the gospel and call on Christ, but they can't call on him if they don't know him. They can't know him unless somebody preaches him. And they can't be, there cannot be preachers, real preachers, unless they are sent. I hope you're familiar with John Murray's commentary on this passage. Um, 
First of all, let me read to you the New American Standard translation of verse 14. How then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? Not concerning whom they have not heard. How shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? I'm going to read an extended portion of Professor Murray's statement. It crystallizes what I'm trying to say. Professor Murray. A striking feature of this clause is that Christ is represented as being heard, Christ is being heard in the gospel when proclaimed by the sent messengers. The implication, the implication is that Christ speaks in the gospel proclamation. It is in this light that what precedes and what follows must be understood. The personal commitment which faith implies is coordinate with the encounter with Jesus' own words in the gospel message. And the dignity of the messengers, reflected on later, is derived from the fact that they are the Lord's spokesmen. In the last clause of verse 14, the apostle is thinking of the institution which is the ordinary and most effectual means of propagating the gospel, namely the official preaching of the word by those appointed to the task. Verse 15 reflects on the necessity of God's commission to those who undertake this office. The presumption, the presumption of arrogating to oneself this function is apparent from what has just been stated. Those who preach are Christ's spokesmen, and only the person upon whom he has laid his hand may act in that capacity. Miracle happens. Man called and thrust out by Christ preaches the gospel and the very voice of Christ himself is heard. And people are responding, not to the preacher, but to Christ himself. That's what we want. But only those whom Christ himself has called. Well, so much for the cause of the ministry. Now, secondly, the success of the ministry. I don't know that we talk about the success of the ministry very much. I think some of us, particularly some of us born and bred Reformed Baptist, are very uncomfortable with the subject of ministerial success. And to be sure, there are dangers. There are extremes to be avoided in any biblically accurate discussion of success in the Christian ministry. It would be very dangerous for us to calculate success according to the culture of celebrity which has arisen over the last couple decades in evangelical Christianity. We think of certain men and when we think of those men, we think of ministerial success. Well, that's okay. The problem is when we think of ministerial success, we think of those men. Well, and yet, even in saying that, we have to be careful that we don't denigrate the work of Christ, the real work of Christ. See, 40 years ago, Names like Jack Howells were held up as models of ministerial success. And churches like Akron Baptist Temple were thought of as the epitome of success. Now, some of you probably never heard of Jack Howells. And you probably never heard of Akron Baptist Temple. When I was in college uh, traveling, representing the school, 
the faculty rep that was with our team thought it would be good for us to stop and take a tour of the Akron Baptist Temple. It was impressive. Airplane could land in their parking lot. The one thing I remember was the largest nursery I had ever seen. 500 beds. 500 beds. I was impressed. But I think I'm confident in saying that names like MacArthur, Carson, Piper, churches like Grace Community Church and Bethlehem Baptist represent the biblical ideals better than those celebrities of 40 years ago. I I find it, frankly, astonishing that men in churches that are known for robust reform theology have gained anything approximating celebrity status in modern evangelicalism. When I entered the ministry, I, uh, the assumption was that you would be consigned to a remote island <laughs> And you would die there with hopefully a few people around you. That was was a prospect for a Reformed Baptist or a Reformed preacher. Something incredible has happened. And we may draw back from certain things, but we must not draw back from giving God praise. Things that some of us preached in a closet to a handful of people are being preached to thousands and thousands of people. Praise God. Even so, we must not calculate success in terms of thousands of church attenders or satellite churches or the number of books that have been published and sold Sorry, Bob. I wasn't talking about you. You see, even where legitimate, those kind of things are exceptional. And they are rare. And they're not to be confused with success in an ordinary Christ-owned ministry. However, while we must guard against that extreme, I think that it is likewise erroneous to limit our definition of success to the preaching of doctrinally sound sermons. And I think there, is, there has been at least a tendency among some of us, I include myself, to think that our ministries were successful if we cranked out theologically sound sermons week after week. Is that ministerial success? I say this with some trepidation. I would rather not be quoted on this because I am a little hesitant, but deep inside, I honestly think that orthodox sermons could be prepared and preached without the Holy Spirit. A successful ministry, what is it? It must be a fruitful ministry. At least that should be our expectation. A faithful ministry, a successful ministry should be a fruitful ministry. Okay, that sounds good. What do you mean by fruit? Well, let me quickly identify some of the marks that I think ought to be expected in a successful ministry. First, there ought to be obvious improvement within the life and ministry of the minister himself. Those who sit under his ministry for any period of time ought to be impressed that he is becoming a better man, a better Christian, a better theologian, and a better preacher. You you know Paul's challenge to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, 
which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them so that your progress may be evident to all. Whatever else occurs under our ministries, the people who observe us over a period of time ought to be impressed that we are growing. Our body of, of divinity is maturing The extremes that were once out there are becoming more symmetrical with the whole message of the Bible. I hate the word um, balanced because it's always used against me. (laughs) So I don't like that word, but there is something to be said for a biblically symmetrical ministry. And most of us, maybe it won't be true of you. I hope it won't be true of you. When I entered the ministry, there were ragged extremes sticking out all over the place. I I hope they're not sticking out so much now. I hope they're not so obvious now. Growth in the body of divinity, growth in the way the Word of God is handled publicly and privately. Secondly, a second aspect of success, maturation and stability within the church itself. Maturation and stability. Now just in saying that, I realize that that presents something of a contradiction. Maturation and stability. Maturation produces a measure of instability. Any parent who has lived with a child passing from pre-puberty into adolescence into early childhood or adulthood will testify that maturation can be very destabilizing to the individual and to everybody around. A maturing church will be a changing church. I don't don't think it's possible to mature without changing. (laughs) There are a lot of things that I look back upon with embarrassment, but one of them is the fact that probably 20 years ago, if you had asked me, how does your church need to change? Change? (laughs) Change? That's compromise. We don't need to change. I look back in that, I'm, I didn't actually say that, but that's why I thought. We've arrived. We've got the principles in place. We're working them out in a proper framework. We don't need to change. We just need for God to bless what we're doing. I said, do Christians need to be sanctified? Does sanctification involve change? The churches need to be sanctified. What is sanctification? But improvement. What is improvement but change? Now, don't get me wrong. The change has to be carefully disciplined by the Bible. It's change toward the Bible, not change away from the Bible. And there's a lot of change going on that may not be biblically defensible. There are churches that are changing away from the Bible. I was thinking about this recently. This is not in my notes. I always get in trouble. What's the most basic definition of a life devoted to Christ? I mean, if you're getting right down to nuts and bolts, how do you quantify a life devoted to Christ? Well, one of the most objective components, measurable components, is time. What are our lives but time? A life truly devoted to Christ can be calculated in terms, not totally or completely, but in part, time devoted to Christ and to the kingdom. What's happening in today's church? Less time requirements are being made upon people. And there are a lot of people who go to find churches and hear great sermons. They invest an hour and a half a week in the public 
aspects of the Christian life. Hour and a half a week. I'm not sure that's changed toward the Bible. Well, it all depends what you're doing with all those other hours. But I think we have to guard against accommodating a a mindset in America that doesn't want to be disciplined by the corporate unit. I, I, I want to be a part of a corporate body, but I don't want that corporate body taking too much of my time or too much of my life Well, read the book of Acts. The early church took a lot of time. Well, that's just an aside. Changing churches, I think, are a necessity, but the challenge for the pastor is to lead the church through change without destroying the church. Uh, We have changed in Mabin in certain ways. I think they're rather small. But there are people who thought they were so drastic that they could no longer hang with us. We we were giving up, we were giving up the most fundamental principles of the Reformed faith. They couldn't show us what they were, but they were sure that we were on that precipice, a downhill slide. There have been others who have left us because we wouldn't change enough. So It's a serious business change. But a reformed church is always what? Reforming. Always working to be more biblical. We don't accept the idea that we have arrived at all the biblical information and we have put it all in due proportion. That isn't happening. So we need to work at change. But we've got to implement change without destroying the stability of the church. How do you do that? The Christian ministry is supernatural, or it's nothing. It would be a miracle if that happens, but it can happen. The last thing I will mention by way of fruitfulness in the ministry is a conversion of souls. Success in the ministry, surely, if it means anything, it means that people are being converted. Our Lord's first words to his disciples, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. When he left this world, his charge to the same men was that they should go into all the world and do what? Make disciples. The book of Acts testifies to the Holy Spirit working through those men and their converts to make disciples of the nations. Acts 17 records a very brief time that Paul spent in the city of Thessalonica. But it was fruitful. And later he speaks in 1 Thessalonians 2.19 that those people were his joy, his glory, conversions. Let me just say that I think it would be a very strange thing if Christ permitted this passion for and usefulness in evangelism to die with the passing of the apostle. I wouldn't go quite so far as Mr. Spurgeon, who said saving souls is our one business. Wouldn't go quite that far. But I do think it is a prominent feature of our business. And I do think... It is one measure of a successful ministry. Well, next lecture, we'll take up the subject of what makes for success in the ministry. Thank you.